Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Could you believe we are at the eve of our last day? These 15 days have sure gone by very quickly. I want to encourage you all that before we end these meetings, that you will make a commitment that your study of the Bible will not end just because these meetings end. I want a commitment that just because my wife and I will be moving on to a new place and a new destination, that you will stand firm, that you will be a light here in the area of Garden Grove. I do this at every church. I come back and I visit. And I want to make sure when I come back that you're still faithful. I thought it'd be fitting to put a couple of pictures on. This here is an evangelistic series, or we call it a revelation seminar in Hawaii. We're actually going to be here in about a week. And one of the most touching stories that I've had was this guy right here. His name is Mike. Mike worked for the Hawaii Waste Control in charge of all of the trash cans. He does the logistics. And I remember I was preaching my heart out in 2010. You know, that, that evangelistic meeting, that Revelation seminar was very dear to me because at the very end of the meetings, I actually proposed to my wife, or to my fiance at the time. So those were very special meetings. But Mike made it extra special because he, he told me, he said, you know, everything you say, it makes sense. His father's a Buddhist. He did not want to give up what he grew up with. But night after night, the truths of the Bible were hitting his heart. And finally, he said to me, Michael, I want to be baptized. And it was such a precious moment when here Mike is about 45 years old, Buddhist, single man, getting into the tank. My dear friend, Pastor Walt Nelson, not knowing God, in fact, he did not want to come to these meetings, but his co-worker happened to sing one night. And his co-worker said, Mike, can you come to these meetings and, and can, you, can you support me? I'm going to sing. And Mike said, okay, I'll come to listen to you, but after that, I'm leaving. So he came and he listened to his friend Daisy give a beautiful rendition of a song. And right when he was about to slip out, I got up to speak. And as I spoke, and my, my then girlfriend was playing the piano, something arrested his attention, and he stayed. He ended up coming every night. After he heard that one, he, he just was addicted. Night after night, he ended up coming. And at the very end, I was able to witness the first person in my life who had grown up to be Buddhist give his heart to Jesus. Amen. To this day, I'm close friends with Mike. He's a pretty wealthy man. And the next year, I preached meetings in Hawaii. And I preached in the country area of Hawaii. And, and they don't want you to wear suits there. You need to wear the local aloha clothes. And I told the locals, I said, you guys have any extra Aloha shirts? I'm not about to buy 10 or 12 Aloha shirts. And here comes Mike. Hey, Michael, I heard you're in the area. I want to do something for you. He comes to me with this bag of Tommy Bahama Aloha shirts. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know how much Tommy Bahama Aloha shirts, I didn't really know. I had to Google it. $120 a shirt. He said, I just want to do something special for you. I was just there in January. I was able to see him. And he said, Michael, pray for me. I'm about to get married. So it's amazing to see how God works. And beloved, I'm so privileged to see what God is doing night after night, meeting after meeting. Let's go ahead and bow our heads 
for a word of prayer. And so, Vino, if I can have some people take off these, take down these mics for me, thank you. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, I come before you thanking you for the opportunity to open your word. Father, I thank you so much for bringing each one of us here night after night. I thank you so much that you are using the Bible to change our lives. Oh, Lord, I pray that we are faithful to you. I pray that we stop holding on to the things of this world and that we will make a decision for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go in our Bibles to Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Now, I'd like to start out this sermon by saying, I love you all. Amen? amen. If you love me, say amen. amen. Now, the reason why I have to start off this sermon that way is because this message is the type of message that doesn't feel good. You know what I mean? Sometimes we need to hear things that are good for our character. Sometimes we need to hear things that's good for our growth. But at the same time, when we hear those things, they're not the fluffy, good things that we usually hear. Now, beloved, I want to make sure you understand that I believe in the gospel. I mean, want to make sure you understand that I believe that you are saved by grace and grace alone. Amen. Amen. When I was in Hollywood and someone was doing Bible studies with me, I remember I would consistently go to John 3.16. Do you know what John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, he shall have everlasting life. Right? Now, I would quote this all the time. And my friend would bring me to other places of the Bible. And I would consistently go to John 3.16. And after a while, my friend said something to me. He said, Michael, do you know any other verses than John 3.16? <laughs> you see, the Bible is God's word, amen? amen? We need to take every word. Can I hear an amen to that? We can't just pick and choose what we want. Do you know what we call those type of Christians? We call them buffet Christians. How many of you like going to buffets? You go to a buffet, you pick and choose whatever you feel like eating. You may like to do that at a restaurant, but when it comes to God's word, we need to take everything. In Luke 16, verse 10, the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is what? Least, Least is also faithful in what? Much. Much. I want you to keep this in mind. This evening's message is entitled, Vanity Affair. Vanity what? Fair. Vanity Affair. Now, many of you have heard of Vanity Fair magazine. We're going to be looking at Vanity Affair. Now, Vanity is going to be an acronym tonight. So V stands for something, A stands for something, N stands for something, T stands for something, and Y stands for something. I like to show this scripture. Notice what it says. Do you not know that your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your what? Your own. Another verse in 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will do what? That's some pretty sobering words, right? Now, don't get mad at me. I'm not telling you these things. 
I'm simply reading what the Bible says. It says, for God's temple is holy, and you are not, and you are that temple. How many of you ever leased a car before? Anyone ever leased a car before? All right. What's the difference with leasing a car versus purchasing a car? Okay, good. Gabby, you got it right. When you lease a car, you don't really own it. I had to find out the hard way. Remember the story I told you? I wanted a sports car. I remember I went there and we only had a certain amount of money and the sports car I wanted was double my, the money that we had. And of course the clever salesperson said, you know what, we'll make sure you come out of here with that car today. And I said, that's impossible, we don't have that kind of money. He said, don't worry about it, you can lease the car. Now the word lease to me didn't sound very good. But all I knew is I could drive the car home that night. It wasn't till the morning after did I realize that after a few years, I got to return the car. Now, I was young back then, and this was the type of car that people like to fix up. People like to put a big exhaust and a muffler. And I remember when my mother told me, she said, you know what, you lease this car, so there's some rules. One rule is this, you can't do anything to the car. The same way that you bought the car is the same way that you have to. That's correct. I think of our bodies the same way. Our bodies are a lease. God sees how faithful we are with our earthly bodies to see if we deserve a heavenly body. Now, there's something about vanity that is all around us today. In fact, the wisest man in the world, Solomon, he said, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. There's something about us looking up to Hollywood stars. There's something about idolizing people. You know what? I like to bring people back to my wedding day. This right here is a beautiful picture of my wife. My wife that day was not wearing any makeup. She wasn't wearing anything crazy. She wasn't even, she wasn't even, there we go. <laughs> my wife didn't even wear something that showed off all her goods. My wife wanted to not only honor me, she wanted to honor God. By the way, when my wife and I got married, our first kiss was also at the altar. In everything that we did, we wanted to honor God. We didn't want to mess around. We said if we put God first in our relationship, he will bless us. Now, I want to make sure you know that God loves beautiful things. But I think sometimes because we live in a vain world, we want to put all those beautiful things on us. Now, God loves gold. The streets in heaven are going to be made of gold. He's going to put a crown of gold on your brow. But nowadays, the world gives us a picture that we should have all sorts of gold all over us. Now, I want to give us a principle. There's nothing inherently wrong with gold, with jewelry, with precious stones. But I want you to see this verse. Go in your Bibles to 1 Peter 3 and verse 3. 1 Peter 3 and verse 3. When you're there, I want you to say amen. Now remember, this evening we're going to be talking about Christian behavior and what it's like to live a Christian life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, verse 3, are we all there? 
It says, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair, by the way, that's not braiding hair. That simply means what, what they did back then is they would put gold in elaborate hairstyles and put on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Now, again, what you do is between you and God. Amen? Amen. At the same time, the principle is don't let the things you wear outshine who you are on the inside. And you see, beloved, instead of us having just a little bit of jewelry or gold, nowadays people are going a little extreme with things. They start to have crazy piercings. I don't know if you noticed, but people are actually having these claws attached to them. It's getting even crazier with piercings all over them. This one is just absolutely atrocious. I don't know how this guy can eat. And of course, the last picture right here, I mean, I don't even know what you want to call this guy. It's gotten to the point that's so bad that Time Magazine did a special. And they said that split tongues are now becoming the new thing in body art. But you see, beloved, it's between you and God what you want to do. It's between you and God in regards to the things you wear and the things you put on. But the principle is this. When people look at you, are they focused on your character or are they focus on the things you're wearing? And I want us to really think about those things because the God that we serve is a God who looks at our inward beauty. Amen. All right. A stands for appetite. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Appetite. Now, one thing about the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that we are the longest living people in the world. As I said the other day, Oprah did a, did a special on us. On Wikipedia, you will find that one of the main things about Seventh-day Adventism is that they live longer. And the Bible promotes a diet that's filled with vegetables and fruits. Did you know the Bible also instructs us regards to what type of food that we can and cannot eat? Did you know that God instructed Noah to bring both clean and unclean animals into the ark? Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every what, everyone? Lean animal, a male and a female, to each animals that are unclean, a male and his female. We're now going to find out what does it mean by a clean and a clean, unclean animal. Here's an interesting little fact. It was only after the flood that God gave human beings permission to eat meat. Now, if you want a complete list of things we're supposed to eat and things we're not supposed to eat, you can go to Deuteronomy 14. The Bible says this in verse 6 through 8. And you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split into two parts. So number one, an animal you eat must have what we call a split hoof. Cows, do they have a split hoof? Yes or no? Yes. What about a horse? No, they don't. There's one more thing. It says, and that chew the cud among the animals then it actually tells us what we should not eat. Nevertheless, of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you shall not eat these things. The camel. How many, how many of you dreamed of eating a camel? The Bible tells us not to eat that. The hare or the rabbit. How many of you want to eat a rabbit tonight? The rock herricks, for they chew the cud, but they do not have cloven hooves. They are unclean for you. All right. Now, I know that some of you don't want to eat camel, but now we're going to talk about something that we probably eat every morning for breakfast. Notice what this is. How many of you like Canadian bacon? Let me tell you what the Bible says. Remember, we need to go with what the Bible says. Also, the swine is unclean for you because it has cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the cud. Do you know what the pig eat? Does anyone know what they eat? Garbage. They eat anything. 
You shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcass. How many of you want to eat Mr. Oink Oink? I don't know about you, but he doesn't look very appetizing. Now, for those of you who maybe need more scientific proof, don't worry, I brought that for you tonight. Did you know that a majority of pigs, they have tapeworms and other bacteria inside? And this right here is a graph of what happens when you eat pigs. These tapeworms go into your system, and unfortunately, some people end up eating bacon or end up eating pork. And here we have a woman who she, she thought she had a tumor, but in reality, what happened was a tapeworm was eating her brain. Now, I actually have a little bit of a clip. If you, can, if you don't mind playing that in the back, it will talk about really how unclean these things are. The most common cause of adult onset epilepsy in the world is called neuropsychosis, which literally means pork tapeworms curled up inside our brain. A review last year out of the Mayo Clinic describes the problem. Cystocerci, meaning the pork tapeworm larvae, create cavities in the human brain and other body tissue where their tiny bodies grow it sometimes looks like that, everyone. into tapeworms two to seven meters in length and can live up to 25 years in the human body. Stop right there. Seven meters means... They have these tapeworms that can actually live many years inside of the human brain, and, it, and a lot of people don't understand why they feel sick or why they're losing weight. Did you know that back in the 1800s, that some people would lose weight by eating tapeworms. They would put tapeworms in their system, and that's how people would lose weight. Little did they know that the tapeworms were eating other things like their organs. Now, of course, to, uh, to just solve the problem, all we have to do is avoid it. Now, sometimes we think God is a mean God for not letting us eat bacon. Now, beloved, you can eat Canadian, you can eat turkey bacon, you can eat vegetarian bacon, but God doesn't want bad things to happen to you. Now, how many of you like seafood? If you like seafood, God also tells us what we can and cannot eat regarding the sea. Deuteronomy 14, verse 9, it says, These you may eat of all that you are in the water. You may eat all that have fins and scales. What are the two things, everyone? All right, so let's go through something. Salmon, can you eat that? Fins and scales. What about yellowtail? Fins and scales, that's right. What about catfish? Why not? Because it's disgusting. No, it's also, because, it's also because catfish don't have scales. That's correct. Now, the Bible also says this. Continues on in 14, verse 10. Whatsoever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean. And unfortunately, that also means lobster, shrimp, it means a bunch of uh, clams, mussels. In fact, Prevention Magazine says shellfish are dirty and dangerous. Now, for those of you who like to eat chicken, those of you who like to eat meat, those of you, us who like to eat steak, whatever it is, that is all clean things to eat. However, there's one thing the Bible says. It says if we are to eat these things, you shall not eat of the fat and of the blood. Does anyone know why? Okay. Guess where all of the bacteria is, all of the disease? It's in the blood and in the fat. So God is saying, I don't want you to get sick. I love you too much, so simply take out the fat and simply take out the blood. All right, let's go ahead and go over N, narcotics. This one is a big one. Did you know that every cigarette you smoke takes 14.5 minutes off your life? Did you know tobacco smoke contains 70 different cancer-causing substances? Now, I was in a fraternity, so I, I feel I have liberty to speak about this. It seems like it always starts out with something. It starts out with beer. Then we want to try the hard stuff. Does the Bible talk about alcohol? You better believe it does. 
Notice what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 1. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray is not wise. Proverbs 23, verse 31 says, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a what? A snake, and it poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, and your mind imagine confusing things. And for some of us who maybe don't have cigarettes, or maybe for some of us we don't drink alcohol, some of us we have other things. And you know, it's interesting because it always starts off with cigarettes. Then it goes to marijuana. Then from marijuana, it goes to the hard stuff. It goes to ecstasy and shrooms. Then it goes to cocaine and crack, speed and heroin. Now, I want to show you some pictures here. These are before and after pictures of what drugs do to you. There's a program in America called From Drugs to Mugs. And it shows what happens when people take narcotics. Now, it's hard to see the center picture, but you can see in the other ones, this guy looks pretty, pretty nice, pretty good looking. Seven years later, what does he look like? Looks pretty bad, right? I got another one. Look at this lady. Decent looking lady, beautiful green eyes. Six years later, seven years later, notice what the drugs did to her. Look what ha can happen in just one year. One year. It's interesting how taking drugs and these unharmful substances can really destroy the temple that God made for us. Now, I have some good news for you. Some of us, we maybe struggle with these habits. Did you know Jesus is stronger than enslaving physical habits? Some of us, we may say to ourselves, but Michael, I've been taking drugs for 14 years. Michael, I have been a chain smoker for 20 years. My grandfather was a chain smoker for 50 years, smoking since he was 13, and right at the end of life, when he, when he was giving his heart to Jesus, he was able to quit smoking. I know some other people, they were on heroin for many years of their life, some of them for 14 years. And by God's grace, he has helped them to have victory over these things. Go in your Bibles. I have a promise for you. Philippians 4, verse 13. Philippians 4, 13. This one's not on the screen. I want you to see this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It's in the New Testament. Philippians 4, 13. Are you all there? All right. Notice this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I want to make sure you see this. For you, those of you taking notes, underline it, highlight it. It's one of those 911 verses that you can always go to. Philippians 4, 13. When you're all there, if you can say amen. amen. The Bible says this. I can do a few things through Christ. What does the Bible say? I can do all things, even give up the most enslaving cigarette habit. I can do all things, even giving up marijuana, even giving up my alcoholic problem. The Bible says I can do all things. Why or how? Who gives you the strength, everyone? It's Christ that gives you that strength. Let me tell you how the Bible works. When God gives you a command, he gives you the power to do it. Did you catch that? When God tells you to do something, he also gives you the power. God never tells you something that you cannot do. I love how God is stronger than any habit on earth. All right, now we're going to go through idols. I. Now, young people, this one is for you. Now, of course, we all have idols, but specifically, specifically as young people, we struggle with certain things. How many of you know what this is? What is that, young people? Twilight. Ooh, they all know it. It's Twilight, right? What's Twilight about? Vampires. That's right. Now, do you think if Jesus was here on this earth, that Jesus would somehow 
be handing out vampire books to everyone? Do you think that he would sit down, the, the little children who, who sit on his lap, and do you think Jesus would say, you know, I have a story to tell you about Twilight, <laughs> Charmed. Do you think that's how Jesus works? No. The Bible says in Philippians 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue in these things, think of these things. Now, beloved, I really don't think God wants us to be watching things or to be reading things that is so against his character. Come on now, sucking blood out of people? Beloved, God was the one who gave blood for people, not suck blood out of them. I just want to make sure we're clear on this because if we are to be Christians, if we are going to take on the name Christian, that means we should act like Christians, amen? amen. Whenever I meet atheists or agnostics, one of the common reasons why they don't want to be Christians is because they say there are so many hypocrites in the church. If we are going to be disciples of Jesus, we need to be disciples of Jesus in the privacy of our own home as well. How many of you know who this is right here? Justin Bieber, right? Now, let me explain. There is nothing wrong with liking Justin Bieber. However, it's crazy how we become fanatics, not just over Justin Bieber, but whoever that boy band is, or whoever the latest musical star is, or whoever our favorite sports team is, right? It doesn't matter who it is or what it is, if we become fanatics over a specific thing, those things become our idols. I'm going to use myself as an example here since I'm allowed to pick on myself. I am, well, I probably was, now, I, now Jesus is in my life, but I was the biggest San Francisco 49er fan. I was born and raised loving 49ers. I told my mother that when I die, I want my ashes sprinkled over Candlestick Point. That's how big of a 49er fan I was. And... You know, I, I, by the way, I'm not one of these bandwagon fans or anything. I like them through all the hard years, everything. I was that type of fan. But what I realized, someone said this to me. I memorized all their statistics. I memorized their star players. I memorized what college they went to. I memorized how many years they were playing in the NFL, not only for them, but also for the Lakers. And I remember someone came up to me. This is before I was a Christian. And he said, you know, if, if you... If you took that same energy that, that, you're, that you have for the 49ers and the Lakers, you'd probably get all A's. And I thought about it. I'm like, man, that is true. And so some people, they ask me, they say, how is it that you know so much about the Bible, Michael? I've never gone to a theology school. I've never gone to formal school. I'm just like every one of you here. All I did was, you know what I did? I'll give you my secret. Some of you want to know, how do you know the Bible so well? I turned off the television, I stopped watching all of this other stuff, and I started reading this. Not just reading it, but studying it, highlighting it, looking at things, quizzing myself, going to someone else and, and, and just having Bible drills with them. But for some of us, maybe it's not sports teams, maybe it's not music, for some of us, it's movies. It's interesting because a lot of times, you know, I'm invited to people's homes. By the way, if you invite me to your home, I'm not going to look at your movie collection. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I'm invited into a lot of people's homes, and it's so interesting because, you know, they ask me, can you give me tips or can you help me to overcome in this area? Or, or here's my favorite one. Someone will tell me, Pastor, pray for me. I have my children are horrible. They have behavior problems, this, this, and this. And I'm looking straight at their rated R movies and violence and video games and everything. You know what I mean? There's a simple principle in the Bible. It's called, by beholding, you become changed. The things you watch are the things you end up going to be becoming. And so when it comes to television or DVDs, it's interesting because a lot of times we have more DVDs or televisions than we have spiritual books. You look at someone's bookshelf, there's one Bible, and it's all dusty. 
There's no other religious books there. And then you look at their DVD section, and it just, they come up and they say, I have every season of friends. <laughs> and, it's, and it's in alphabetical order. Have mercy, beloved. We are Christians. I really hope and pray that, that these things are not things that are, I'm sharing with you just, just because they're funny or just because you know, they're, even, they're even hurtful or anything. I hope and pray that what it will cause you to do is grow in your walk with Christ. That's my desire. Now, some of us here, you're saying, I'm safe. I'm not a sports fan. I don't care about Justin Bieber. I don't read Twilight. And I don't have movies. All right, this one's for you then. How many of you are slaves to the computer then? How many of you are slaves to not only the computer, not only the internet, but your Facebook status? You know the whole world's on Facebook when my almost 60-year-old mother is adding me as a friend on Facebook. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I looked at all my friend lists, and I'm like, my, my mom knows how to get on Facebook? <laughs> now, I want to make sure you know there's nothing wrong with Facebook. I have Facebook. But there is something wrong when it becomes an addiction, when we're spending more time on Facebook than in God's book. And I want to make sure you just understand the principle here. All right, for some of you, you're saying, okay, well, I'm still safe. I'm not on the computer. I don't watch movies. I'm not a sports fanatic. I don't watch Twilight. I don't care about, I don't care about Justin Bieber. But you are maybe a Texaholic. <laughs> you know, I can't believe some people can text quicker than they can talk. <laughs> Have you met those kind of people? And uh, there's other people who I know, they would rather text than talk. I try calling them on the phone. They like, I think they push end on me. I really do. And then I'll get a text saying, hey, what's up? <laughs> what? Can't even talk to me? I have this friend of mine. I'm not going to say his name because some people in this room may know him. And once in a while, I'll catch up with him. We'll go out to eat. And I didn't bring my phone on me. And we'll be sitting there waiting for the food. I haven't seen him in months. And we're sitting right across from each other. And he's on his phone, texting playing on Farmville, or doing something else, right? And it's like, wow, here we have a phone that's supposed to be a tool, but this thing has totally possessed our life. Let me show you this article. It's interesting. Forbes magazine. This made front story, cover story on Forbes. Could you go three months without a mobile phone, email, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter? This is called the Amish Project. <laughs> do you know why it made front news? Because no one can do it. And so they were featuring this college student who said, I'm going to go and do the impossible, and I'm going to go three months without Facebook, without Twitter, without LinkedIn, without any of these things, without a mobile phone. You know, it's so interesting because we have email, we have a phone, we have the ability to communicate in seconds to each other. But it's interesting because I feel as though we are less connected than before. It's to the point where you would rather text someone, you would rather email them than really spend face-to-face -face time with them. Beloved, I really started to think about this because... God wants a real, genuine relationship with us. And I think it's gotten to the point, and, and a lot of people, they're wanting to know, why is it that my children have such a short attention span? I'll tell you why. Because they're used to 
texting and tweeting and, and Facebooking and everything else. Everything is instant gratification. Before, you actually had to wait by a phone. Some of you may not remember this, but there was a time, I remember this, when I would have to tell some girl I liked, I'd say, okay, be by your phone at 7 o'clock in the evening. There were no cell phones back then. Only Zach Morris had a cell phone. And you would just wait by your phone, your landline, and you would pick up your phone at 7 o'clock. And if you didn't reach them, you left a message on the answering machine. Now, you young kids maybe don't know what an answering machine is. <laughs> it was ancient. You got home, and, and, and it had this red light flashing if someone... If someone left messages and you'd push the button in and you'd have like 10 messages and you'd sit there with a paper and pen writing down the messages and listening to the phone numbers and if they spoke too fast, you would you'd do it again. Modern technology is so interesting. I just got my, my new phone and there's this option where I don't even have to listen to voicemails anymore. It turns my voicemails into texts. It's like, wow, this is crazy. We are living in an age where times are rapidly changing. But beloved, in spite of all these changes, I hope we never lose focus of what's really important. I hope with all the distractions, Twitter can be a good thing, trust me. Facebook can be a good thing. Email, texting, phones, all of those can be a good thing. But if that takes more time, than the Word of God. If those things occupy your mind more than the Word of God, there's some reprioritizing that needs to take place in your life. Amen. It's sad in the morning, I find myself sometimes more excited to check if I have any messages, more excited to check my email than read God's Word. Like it's a struggle sometimes. Maybe I'm the only one here. But sometimes I'll be looking and I'm, and I'm like, maybe, maybe someone called me or this happened. And I won't be as excited about reading the Word of God. And tonight's message is really about refocusing our attention on God's Word. Amen. Now, how do we do that? This is where we have T, trust in God. Go in your Bibles to Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. I recommend that you memorize this text. It's a really good text. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not in thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Some of us, we want to know how I want God to lead me. I want God to answer my prayers. I want God to show me his will. Real simple. Is your trust in the Lord? Are you acknowledging him in all your ways? Now, someone said it to me best like this. You know where your trust is by your dollar bills. After all, our dollar bills, it says, in God we trust. You can tell what is really important in your life by the things you spend your money on. So for those of you, you want to know what's important in my life, at the end of the day, at the end of the month, go and see what is, imp what is really important in my life. For some of us, it will say golf. For other of us, it will say movies, going out to the movies every weekend. For, for maybe some of us, it will say food, right? Going out to different restaurants. For some of us, maybe it will be traveling. I hope and pray that at the end of the year, and I like this time of the month because this is where we examine all the things we've spent our money on. We can see, am I being faithful in my money? Am I being faithful in the resources God has given me? Now, listen to this verse. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. It says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who what? He gives you power to get wealth. For those of you who are doctors and nurses, teachers and accountants, and you say to yourself, well, I worked hard for my money. I went to school and I took a special test. Beloved, God gave you power to get your wealth. 
Haggai 2 verse 8, it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Now, in the Bible, I want to introduce you to a topic. It's called tithing. Called what, everyone? Tithing. What it simply means is this. Out of all the money you make, you're to give one-tenth to God. Ten percent. So if you made $100, how much do you give to God? Ten. Real simple. Now, God's the one who gave us the money. God could have easily said, okay, $90 is mine, and you can have the $10. But what does God do? He says, just give me 10. Just give me 10. And I find that giving God that 10, it really puts into perspective, where is my heart? And when I find myself, it's so hard to give that 10. Oh, Lord, bills are so tough this month. It's really easy for me to spend 10% of my income on movies or on food or on something else. But when it comes to God writing that check to the church or writing it to, to, to ministry, oh, it's so hard for me to do. That means my heart is not in the right place. Notice what the Bible says, Genesis 28, verse 22. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Leviticus 27, verse 30. And on the tithe of the land, whether of the seed or of the land of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord's. Malachi 3, verse 8, it says, You have robbed me. But you say, And where have I robbed you, Lord? In tithes and offerings. Now, let me make sure this is clear. By the way, one thing I like about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it's not all about money. How many times have we asked for an offering here? How many times have you seen plates going around? Zero, right? Because we are not doing these meetings to charge people. We're not doing this to make money. We are doing this because we want you to know the principles of the Word of God, and some of the principles means God wants you to give of your money to help support the ministry, but it's also for you. God wants to make sure that you get a blessing by giving to the ministry. The Bible says, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Tithes is how much percent, everyone? 10%. Offerings is your free will. You can give whatever you, you choose. I love what it says in verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. If there's one time God is giving you a dare, he says, test me in this. Give me 10%. Give me 10%. Did you know that God can do more with 90% of money that you have because you gave 10%, then 100% on your own. Amen. God says, try me in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be not enough room to receive it. Wow. Do you want blessings like that? Amen. I can't hear you. Do you want blessings like that? This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. This is God's formula. This is not a multi-level marketing thing. This is not God saying, I want you to play the lottery. God is simply saying, give me 10% and try me. I will bless you in more ways than you can ever imagine. God's math is weird. It doesn't make sense. See, we go by addition, God goes by multiplication. Amen. I remember when I was in the corporate world, I was making good money. 22 years old, I was making you know, close to six figures, all the bonuses and everything. And I remember, you know, I had a good amount saved. And then I remember when I became an evangelist, the amount of money I made back then was not even close. But the amount of savings is so much more. Mm -hmm. And I look and I say, how does this work? It's weird how the way God does things. Let me, let me give you a quick, an, another example. When my wife and I got married, we decided to do something. On our invitation cards, we put on the back, 
we said, we don't want a gift registry. We don't want you to give us money. We want you to donate all the money that you would have given us. Whatever gifts you would have given us, let's just say you would have bought us pillows or, or, or blankets or whatever. Whatever you were going to give us, we want you to give it to this nonprofit. It's basically to this, to this offering fund that, we, that my wife and I set up. And I remember, and you know, in the, in the Filipino culture, we have what are called sponsors, Ninong and Ninox, and they give a lot of money. When it was all said and done, my wife, we had probably close to $13,000. Do you know how hard it was for me to write that check and to say, okay, Lord, this is not my money. I promise to give you all of that. And I wrote that entire check to ministry. That was my very first, that was our first money that my wife and I had together. We gave it all. Amen. That was a little tough to do, I have to tell you. <laughs> but let me tell you how God blessed. We got a call from our employer saying, you know, we made a mistake on your, pay, your payroll. We didn't pay you enough. So we owe you over $7,000. How many times does your employer call you saying, we made a, we made a mistake. Here's an extra $7,000. Then we did our taxes. And we did our taxes, and there was another eight or $9,000. And God reminded me of the $13,000 I gave. And he reminded me of over the $15,000 I was getting back. And I was like, wow, you cannot outgive God. Amen. Now, the reason why I say that is because some of us were hurting financially. But when it comes to things, never skimp on giving God the money. Amen. He asked you, he says, try me now. The last one that we have as we close, vanity. Why? That's the question we're going to ask tonight. Go ahead and go in your Bibles to Mark 8, verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Listen to what the Bible says. We're asking this question as we close. The Bible says, are we all there? Yes. All right, praise God. For what shall it profit a man if he shall, what everyone, gain the whole world and what? Lose his soul in the process. I think of this story. This is actually me in Africa. I'm touching a hyena here. I, I went there, I preached my heart out in Africa. And the person who I was with, a game warden, he said, you could touch this hyena. It's a friendly one. Did you know that in Africa, they train hyenas to be guard dogs? So imagine if you're a criminal and you break into a home and you don't have a German shepherd waiting for you. You have a hyena waiting for you. Did you know that hyenas have the strongest jaw in the world? they can crush 10,000 pounds per square inch. Now he's telling me these facts as I'm thinking if I should touch this thing. I went by the hyenas. He's telling me it's safe to touch this guy. They took me to the black rhino park. This is an endangered species known as a black rhino. There's no cages here. It's me and the rhino. That's a front view of him. But of all the exhibits in Africa, of all the things, rhinos, saw lions, saw giraffes. This right here is me right next to a giraffe, just a few feet away from me. This is me right next to some lions. These lions, I mean, look at that picture. The guy could jump over the fence. They wanted to show me just how fast and ferocious these are. But of all the things in Africa that were fascinating, 
It was the monkeys that got my attention. The monkeys were the most fascinating. The monkeys, they had activity in hand. They had life. And they, I, was, I was reminded of this story about monkeys. And this is why I, I consider them so fascinating. There was a particular park that had a, a monkey problem. It was infested with these furry, cute creatures. Now, monkeys can be also a pest. They can eat things and take things. And they were trying to figure out what should they do to get rid of these monkeys. One expert who was, who his specialty was capturing monkeys. He said, you don't need to use one of those taser guns. You don't even need to use a net. All you need to do, all you need to have is a jar, a simple jar. Have a jar that gets tighter at the neck. Put inside of the jar a banana, oranges. And what they would do is they would put these jars, they would bury them inside of the ground. They would put them inside of trees. And the monkeys, what would happen is they would see the fruit, they would smell it. And they would put their hand inside. Their hand could fit easily inside the jar. They would then grab the orange and they would try to take their hand out. And what do you think? Couldn't, right? It was stuck. These monkeys would pull, and they would pull, and they would pull. And of course, they're not going to get out of this jar. This jar is solid. And you would hear these monkeys making a fuss, and you would hear them screaming, and you would hear them yelling. You would hear them making all sorts of noises. Their hand was stuck. And it was interesting because these game wardens would see these monkeys making a ton of noise and would calmly walk up to the monkeys. The monkey sees the game warden. He knows that the game warden's going to catch him. What does the monkey have to do in order to go free? Just let go. But as the game warden's getting closer and closer to the monkey, the monkey would not let go. Even if it meant being caught. Stupid monkey, huh? Do you know where I'm going with this? The devil has put traps in our way. You can call it Facebook, you can call it Twitter, you can call it Justin Bieber, you can call it you can call it twilight, you can call it whatever you want. The devil has put these traps. Why are we holding on to it so bad? All we have to do is what, everyone? Let go and let God. But we are so stuck to these idols that we would almost rather lose out on eternal life. This right here is probably the most precious picture that I own. His name is Blue. He is the most incredible musician I've ever met. He plays over 30 instruments, saxophone better than Kenny G. The piano, better than Jim Brickman. He plays and conducts, writes his own music. I preached my heart out in the Philippines. He was my musician. Night after night, he would be playing for me. It's now the final night, and I've called people to make decisions, just as we have been the last few days. And Blue comes up to me and he says, Michael, I can't play for you tonight. 
And I said, why not? Are you sick? Why can't you play? And Blue said, Michael, I need to stand. I need to stand tonight. I realized that this precious piano player, night after night as he was playing for the pews, his heart was being convicted. Beloved, there are some of us who still need to make decisions tonight. There are some of us, God has been tugging on your heart. And as you know, we are going to have some baptisms tomorrow. We're going to have some baptisms the next Saturday as well. For those of you who decide to get baptized tomorrow, I'm thankful my wife and I will be there. We'll get to take a picture with you. And for us, it means a lot. I go around the world and I share these pictures of, of people who've been baptized at my meetings. For me, I don't need the money of this world. I don't need the trophies. These pictures, they mean all the world to me. Tonight, I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads, to close your eyes. I'm gonna ask for a special heart-searching ceremony to take place now, for us to search our hearts and to ask God if he is calling us The first appeal that I have for you tonight, those of you who are saying there is something in my life I need to give up, there is something that is an idol to me, there is something that I need to get rid of, tonight I want to be free from the chains of sin, I ask you to stand. Some of you here, you're saying, God, please, please free me from the addictions that I have. God, please help me. You know that I'm addicted to movies. You know I'm addicted to this. I spend more time with this than you. For some of you here tonight and you're saying, I need help and I want to give that up to you, I ask you to stand. You're asking for a special prayer. Beloved, God is working on the hearts. There's got to be more than this. I'm standing and saying, Father, change my wicked heart. You know that I like the things of the world. Lord, you know that I like checking on, on Sports Center and I like to know who's winning. Help me, Lord, for those things not to take priority. Someone here, you know that you need, a, you need to give up your Facebooking. Some of us here, you know that you need to give up the addictions that you have to these novels. Some of you here, you know that your movie collection is bigger than the collection of spiritual things. Someone here needs to make that decision and say, Lord God, please, I want those things to be freed from my life. By you standing, you're asking for special power. By you standing, you are standing in the sight of God and it's being written in heaven, it's being recorded, and God is taking note of those things. Praise God for your courage. Praise God for, for you standing up. My next appeal. For those of you who are saying, not only do I need to give up those things, but I want to make my decision for Jesus in baptism. I want to say, Lord, the world behind me and the cross before me. For those of you who are saying, I want to make my decision to be baptized. I want my sins to be washed free. I ask you to come forward. Come forward. Anyone who's getting baptized tomorrow, the week after, whatever it is, come forward. By you coming forward, it doesn't mean that you are making a decision tomorrow. It says, I am committed. I want to be baptized. I am saying, Father, I am not perfect, but I am committed. Someone else needs to make a decision. Father in heaven, please work on the hearts even now. Father in heaven, continue to work as we are battling this decision. Is there someone else who needs to make this everlasting choice? You know, today we were able to see a marriage. It was a beautiful ceremony. But marriage is for a lifetime. Baptism is for eternity. Someone else who needs to make a decision for baptism. You are just saying, I want to 
I want to get studies. I want to get closer to Christ. Doesn't mean you're going to get baptized tomorrow. But you are saying, right now I am making the decision. I promise you it's the best decision you'll ever make. Anyone else wants to make a decision for rebaptism? Some of you, you've been baptized once, but you want to be rebaptized. Beloved, it is the best decision. Trust me on this. Trust what the scriptures say. You are saying, I want to be free from the things I've done. I want to go before God publicly and declare that I am His. Anyone else wants to make the decision publicly for Jesus? Anyone else wants to come forward? Praise God for all the souls that we see here right now. Praise God for all the 25 decisions. Anyone else? I won't hold this much longer. God is working. Someone else wants to make a decision. You're saying, Lord, please. You know that I need to give my heart 100% for you. Praise God. Someone else made a decision. Anyone else wants to make a decision? Praise God. The Spirit of God is working. Beloved, again, this is the best decision you'll ever make. No regrets on this decision. It's risk-free. This is the moment where Jesus comes into your heart. This is the moment where you declare before heaven and earth, I am done with this world. Praise God for all these souls up here. Anyone else wants to make a decision for Jesus? Wants to make this public commitment? Let's bow our heads as we commit these people to Jesus. And if anyone else during this prayer, if you feel like God is tugging on your heartstrings, please come forward. Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you so much for the free gift of salvation. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you give us this opportunity to be freed from the chains of sin. And Lord, I thank you for those who are standing, those who are publicly saying there is something in my life that I must be freed from. And Father, I want to thank you for these brave souls who are willing to stand and come forward. Jesus, you didn't feel like walking those two and a half miles to Calvary, but you did because you love us. You saw us. You saw me. You saw each and every one of us here. And you were willing to pay the price. And Father, these people who are standing today, who are saying, I am done with this world. Publicly, I'm declaring that I am a child of God. Father, I pray that you keep them in your hallowed care. I pray again, Father, for your Holy Spirit to work in the hearts, that if there's someone here who needs to make a decision, that they will come even now. Please, Father, help us to stop playing around with you. Many of us are dating you. We're in and out of a relationship. I pray that we'll be married to you, committed entirely. Thank you, Father, for this I ask in the name of Jesus, in his crucified and resurrected name, amen. For those of you who are standing, if you don't mind walking to my right, we're going to have a special prayer time and vigil for you. If you can walk to my right, you can see Pastor Dan right there. Everyone who's standing, if you can go to my right. If you are standing for baptism, we want to make sure that we get your that we have a special prayer time with you. It means the world to me. Praise God, Daniel. Praise God, Jessica. The best decision you can make. Beloved, I want to thank you for coming each and every night. Tomorrow we have one more day. Starting tomorrow at 11 
we are going to be having church right here. Then we're going to have the baptism right after that. And there's one more baptism at 6 o'clock. Then we're going to have our final message. Please be here at 645. It'll be my last time that I'll be presenting. My last time that my wife and I can, can take pictures with you, can pray with you, can encourage you. Tomorrow I give you my email and phone number. And if you ever have a Bible question, I ask you to please stay in touch. I promise you I'm going to be back here. And when I come back, I want to see these seats filled. I want to see you still in church. Please remain faithful. Good night.